little fox. Anne of Green Gables, Chapter One. Mrs. Lynde is surprised. Mrs. Rachel Lynde lived on the main road in Avonlea, a town on Prince Edward Island off the coast of Canada. Anybody who was coming to or leaving Avonlea had to use the main road and pass by the Lynde's house. Mrs. Lynde was always watching from her kitchen window. Mrs. Lynde sat at her window one afternoon in early June. At half past three, Matthew Cuthbert was driving his buggy down the road. He wore his best suit. Matthew should be planting turnip seeds now, like Mr. Lind, thought Mrs. Lind. But instead, he is in his buggy and dressed in his best suit. Where is Matthew Cuthbert going, and why? If it was any other man in Avonlea, Mrs. Lind might be able to guess where he was going. But Matthew Cuthbert so rarely left home that it had to be something unusual. He was the shyest man alive and hated to go anywhere he might have to talk. I'll just go to Green Gables and ask his sister Marilla where he's gone, she decided. After hearing, Come in, from Marilla, Mrs. Lynn stepped into the kitchen. She looked carefully at everything on the table. There were three plates, so Marilla must have been expecting a visitor to come home with Matthew. But the dishes were everyday dishes, and the cake was plain, so the expected visitor could not be anybody too important. Good evening, Rachel, Marilla greeted Mrs. Lynde. This is a lovely evening, isn't it? Won't you sit down? How are you? Marilla was tall and thin. Even though she looked stern, she did have a sense of humor. We're well, said Mrs. Lynde. Though I thought you weren't well when I saw Matthew in the buggy today. Marilla had expected Mrs. Lynde to visit because Mrs. Lynde was a curious person. Matthew went to Bright River, Marilla said. We're getting a little boy from an orphanage, and he's coming on the train tonight. If Marilla had said that Matthew had gone to meet a kangaroo from Australia, Mrs. Lynde could not be more surprised. She actually stopped talking for five seconds. Why on earth would you do that? She asked disapprovingly. We've been thinking about it for some time. All winter, in fact, replied Marilla. Matthew is growing older. He's 60, and his heart is not so good. It's difficult to hire someone to do farm work. Mrs. Lynde always said what she thought. In this case, it was, Well, Marilla, I think you're doing a very foolish thing. You're bringing a strange child into your house, and you don't know a thing about him. Last week in the newspaper, it said that a family took an orphan boy and he set fire to the house at night, on purpose, Marilla, and nearly burnt them in their beds. Marilla was neither offended nor alarmed. Meanwhile, Matthew Cuthbert and the horse jogged the ten kilometers to the station. It was a pretty road, and the air was sweet with the smell of apple and plum blossoms. When Matthew arrived, there was no train, and he thought he was early. The long platform was almost deserted, except for a girl sitting at the end. Matthew walked quickly past her to the station office. The 5.30 train is gone, but there was a passenger for you, a little girl, said the station master. I'm not expecting a girl, said Matthew, surprised. It's a boy I've come for. The station master raised his eyebrows. Well, I guess there's some mistake. Mrs. Spencer came off the train with that girl. She said you and your sister, Marilla, were adopting the girl from an orphanage. The girl watched Matthew. She was 11 years old and dressed in a very old and very ugly dress. On her head was a worn-out brown hat. Under the hat were two braids of very thick, very red hair. Her face was small, white, and thin, and she had many freckles. I suppose you are Mr. Matthew Cuthbert of Green Gables? she said in a clear, sweet voice. She held out her hand. I'm very glad to see you. I was afraid you weren't coming for me. I had decided if you didn't come for me, I'd climb up that big wild cherry tree. It would be lovely to sleep in a wild cherry tree under the moon, don't you think? Matthew shook the little hand awkwardly and wondered what to say. 
Matthew could not say there was a mistake, he would take her home and let Marilla explain everything. I'm sorry I was late, he said shyly. Come along. The horse is over in the yard. Oh, I'm very glad you came, the girl said. Even if it would be nice to sleep in a cherry tree, it's wonderful I'm going to live with you and belong to you. I've never belonged to anybody, not really. The girl kept talking as they drove down the main road. Isn't it beautiful? She said. I've always heard that Prince Edward Island is the prettiest place in the world. I used to imagine living here, but I never expected I actually would. Am I talking too much? She went on. People always tell me I do. If you say so, I'll stop. I can stop, though it is difficult. Surprisingly, Matthew was enjoying himself. He'd never expected to enjoy the company of a young girl. He said shyly, Oh, you can talk as much as you like. I don't mind. I'm so glad. You and I will get along just fine. I feel nearly perfectly happy. I can't feel perfectly happy because, well, what color is this? The girl held up one of her braids. It's red, isn't it? He said. <sighs> yes, it's red. She said, sighing. Now you see why I can't be perfectly happy. Nobody with red hair can be perfectly happy. We're near home now, Matthew said uneasily. As they approached Green Gables, he did not think about Marilla or himself or the mistake. He thought only about the child's disappointment when she discovered the truth. Anne of Green Gables, Chapter 2, Anne with an E. Marilla opened the door. She saw the odd girl in the ugly dress with long red braids and big eyes. Matthew Cuthbert, who's that? She said. Where's the boy? There wasn't any boy, said Matthew slowly. There was only her. He nodded at the child. He realized he didn't even know her name. No boy? But there must be a boy, insisted Marilla. We asked Mrs. Spencer for a boy. Well, I asked the station master and Mrs. Spencer didn't bring a boy, said Matthew. I had to bring the girl home. Well, what do we do now? asked Marilla. During this conversation, the child was silent. Suddenly, she understood what was happening. You don't want me, she cried. You don't want me because I'm not a boy. I should have known. Nobody ever did want me. She burst into tears. Neither Marilla nor Matthew knew what to do. Finally, Marilla said, Well, well, there's no need to cry. You can stay here until we find out what happened. What's your name? The child stopped crying and asked eagerly, Will you please call me Cordelia? Call you Cordelia? Is that your name? asked Marilla. No, it's not exactly my name, but I would love to be called Cordelia. It's a beautiful name. I don't know what you mean. If Cordelia isn't your name, what is? Marilla asked. Anne Shirley, the girl answered. But Anne is such an unromantic name. Anne is a good, plain, sensible name, said Marilla. It's all right, but I like Cordelia better. If you must call me Anne, please call me Anne spelled with an E, Anne said. What does it matter how it's spelled? asked Marilla, trying to stop a smile. Oh, it looks so much nicer. A-N-N -N looks horrible, but A-N-N-E looks more distinguished. Did Mrs. Spencer bring any other orphans besides you? Marilla inquired. She brought Lily Jones for herself, Anne answered. Lily is only five years old, and she is very beautiful. She has nut-brown hair. If I were very beautiful and had nut-brown hair, would you keep me? No, we want a boy to help Matthew on the farm. A girl is no use. Now, take off your hat and let's eat dinner. Anne took off her hat, and they sat down to eat. But Anne could not eat. 
She nibbled at the bread and butter and nibbled at the apple pie. When dinner was finished, Marilla showed Anne to a spare bedroom. Anne got into bed and put her head right under the covers. Good night, Marilla said a little awkwardly, but kindly. Suddenly, Anne's head reappeared. How can you say it's a good night when you know it's the worst night I've ever had? She cried. She disappeared under the covers again. Marilla went into the kitchen and started to wash the dishes. Matthew sat on a chair, saying nothing. One of us will have to take the girl back tomorrow, said Marilla. I suppose so, said Matthew reluctantly. You suppose so, Marilla echoed. Don't you know so? Well, now she's a real nice little thing, Marilla. It's a pity to send her back. She likes it so much here, said Matthew. Matthew Cuthbert, do you really think we should keep her? said Marilla, astonished. Well, no, not exactly, stammered Matthew. Of course we cannot keep her, said Marilla. What good would she be to us? We might be some good to her, said Matthew unexpectedly. Matthew Cuthbert, I can see that you want to keep her. That girl has bewitched you. Well, now, she's a real interesting little thing, said Matthew. You should have heard her talk, coming from the station. Oh, she can talk all right. I don't like children that talk so much. I don't want an orphan girl, and if I did, it wouldn't be her. The next morning, Anna woke and sat up in bed. For a moment, she couldn't remember where she was. First, she had a delightful thrill, and then a horrible memory. This was Green Gables, and they didn't want her because she wasn't a boy. She got dressed and went downstairs for breakfast. I'm pretty hungry this morning, she announced. I'm glad it's such a sunny morning, but I like rainy mornings as well. All sorts of mornings are interesting, don't you think? You don't know what's going to happen throughout the day. Anything could happen. For goodness sake, be quiet, said Marilla. Anne obeyed and was so silent that it made Marilla nervous. Matthew was also quiet, but this was natural, so the meal was a very silent one. After breakfast, Anne washed the dishes, and then Marilla told her to go and play outside. Anne ran to the door, excited. Then she stopped suddenly, came back, and sat at the table. What's the matter now? said Marilla. I can't go out, said Anne. It's no use loving green gables. If I go out and meet all those trees and flowers, it'll just be harder to leave. Marilla thought, In all my life, I never saw or heard anything like it. She is kind of interesting, as Matthew says. I am already wondering what she'll say next. But when evening came, Marilla and Anne got in the buggy and left Green Gables. They were on their way to Mrs. Spencer's house. Anne of Green Gables, Chapter 3, Marilla Makes Up Her Mind I decided to enjoy this drive, Anne said to Marilla on the way to Mrs. Spencer's house. I've learned you can nearly always enjoy something if you try hard. I'm not going to think about going back to the orphanage. I'm just going to think about the drive. Oh, look, there's a wild rose! She went on. Isn't it lovely? Wouldn't it be nice if roses could talk? And isn't pink the most bewitching color in the world? I love it, but I can't wear it. Red-headed people can't wear pink. Do you know anybody whose hair color changed when they grew up? No, said Marilla wearily. And I don't think your hair color will change either. Well, that's another hope gone. My life is a graveyard of buried hopes. That's a sentence I read in a book once. I say it to comfort myself when I'm disappointed. How does it comfort you? Asked Marilla, surprised. Why, because it sounds so nice and romantic, as if I were a heroine in a book. If you're going to keep talking, you should tell me something about yourself, said Marilla. Can I make it up? 
Anne asked. It'll be much more interesting. No, I don't want any stories. Just stick to the facts. Where were you born, and how old are you? Asked Marilla sternly. I was 11 last March, said Anne. And I was born in Nova Scotia. My father and mother were both high school teachers. They were very poor and lived in a tiny yellow house. I was born in that house. Mrs. Thomas said I was an ugly baby, scrawny and thin, but that my mother thought I was perfectly beautiful. She died of fever when I was only three months old, and soon after, my father died from fever too. So I was an orphan and nobody knew what to do with me. Father and mother had both come from places far away and had no relatives around. Finally, Mrs. Thomas took me in, even though she was poor and her husband was a drunk. I lived with them until I was eight years old. I helped look after the children, and it was hard work. Then Mr. Thomas was killed when he fell under a train. After that, I lived with the Hammonds, who had eight children. She had twins three times. I like babies, but twins three times is too much. I got so tired carrying them around. I lived with the Hammonds for two years, and then Mr. Hammond died. I had to go to the orphanage because the Hammonds didn't want me any longer either. It was too crowded in their house. Did you ever go to school? Marilla asked. A little bit, answered Anne. I can read well, and I know lots of poetry. Don't you just love poetry? Were those women, Mrs. Thomas and Mrs. Hammond, good to you? Asked Marilla, looking at Anne carefully. Uh, um... Stammered Anne, blushing with embarrassment. They tried to be good to me. I'm sure they meant to be good. Marilla asked no more questions. She suddenly felt pity for Anne, who hadn't had much love in her short life. Soon they arrived at Mrs. Spencer's house. Well... Mrs. Spencer exclaimed. You're the last folks I expected. How are you, Anne? All right, said Anne without smiling. Mrs. Spencer, began Marilla. I'm sorry, but there's been a mistake. We told the orphanage we wanted a boy. Oh, Mrs. Spencer said. That's too bad. I'm very sorry. I'm sorry, too, said Marilla. Can we send the child back? The orphanage will take her, won't they? I suppose so, said Mrs. Spencer thoughtfully. But wait a minute. Mrs. Blewett was here yesterday. She told me she would like a little girl. Marilla was not very pleased to hear this. Mrs. Blewett had a terrible temper and did not treat servant girls well. Look, there's Mrs. Blewett now, said Mrs. Spencer. A thin-faced, frowning woman came over to the house. How lucky. She can take Anne now. Mrs. Spencer explained the mistake to Mrs. Blewett. Mrs. Blewett looked Anne over from head to toe. How old are you and what's your name? She demanded. My name is Anne Shirley and I'm 11 years old. Anne replied. You're too thin, but you're wiry, snapped Mrs. Blewett. The wiry ones are the best. You'll be a good girl and work hard. All right, Miss Cuthbert. She said to Marilla, I'll take her home now. I don't know, Marilla said slowly. Matthew and I haven't decided what to do yet. If we decide not to keep Anne, I'll send her over tomorrow. All right, said Mrs. Blewett ungraciously. At Marilla's words, Anne's eyes grew bright like stars. Can I really stay at Green Gables? She whispered to Marilla. We'll decide tonight, said Marilla crossly. But you heard me. You might go to Mrs. Blewett. She needs you more than Matthew and I do. Oh, send me to the orphanage instead. Mrs. Blewett looks like a monster, said Anne. Anne Shirley, don't talk like that, Marilla scolded. Go and sit quietly and be a good girl. I'll be anything you want if you will keep me, pleaded Anne. Later, Marilla told Matthew about Anne's history and the trip to Mrs. Spencer's house. I wouldn't give a dog to Mrs. Blewett, said Matthew. I don't like Mrs. Blewett's style either, admitted Marilla. Since you want to keep the girl, I suppose she can stay. I've never brought up a child, 
especially a girl. I'll probably make a mess of it, but I'll do my best. Matthew's shy face glowed with delight. Marilla, I hoped you would change your mind. She's such an interesting little thing. Yes, well, don't interfere, Matthew, Marilla said. I won't tell Anne tonight because she'll be so excited she won't sleep. An old maid might not know much about raising children, but neither does an old bachelor. Goodness knows what will come of it. Little Fox.